Hey guys, welcome back to another video. I'm building a chest for the battery banks to sit in and it's gonna be kind of like a bench slash day bed slash kids bed um, that's gonna go up against the, the wall where you open the front door. It's gonna go right there underneath the big kind of picture window. And so it'll act as kind of like a bench or booth seat for the little fold up table. It's gonna be a very multifunctional piece. I was thinking about building it in, but I'm not gonna do that because I wanna be able to like take it out of the cabin if it's in the way and you know set it out on the deck if you want to you know sit around a fire or, or you know need seating for friends or something like that right so gonna make it a little standalone piece so i've got a bunch of fur here this is old growth dug fur that i've had stored up in my barn for a while so i'm going to just start kind of cutting it to rough dimensions milling it down to thickness and gluing up the panels you know for the top the sides the ends and everything then i'm going to go and do some little final design tweaks and get this thing manifest into reality because that's what I do. So got a pile of lumber here. I milled everything to about an inch and an eighth thickness. Um, then I'm just going to glue it up. You can see there's still kind of table saw marks and stuff. So once the panels are glued up, um, I'll run them through the planer, take them down to probably an inch final thickness. That way they're nice and smooth. All right, so um, I've planed down these two um, panels that I glued together. Now I glued them in two separate panels because if I would have glued all four together, they would have been too wide to fit on my planer. Uh, but then I also realized that even with these two panels, I don't have quite enough width for what I'm wanting. I need at least 20 inches on the inside of my ca um, cabinet or inside of the chest bench, whatever, to fit those battery banks in. So um, adding an extra board here, which I can then you know rip this whole panel down to the desired width once I've got it all glued up. So I've planed all the boards to the one inch finished thickness. And so now I'm just gonna glue them up, try to get them as flush and flat as possible. So there's no, and then, uh, then I'll have my top ready to go here. And I can, Get the rest of the panels glued up and start making templates. But this is typically how I do larger glue ups. I'll do them in sections that'll fit into the planer, plane them really close, like within a 16th or a 32nd even, so that I can just sand it to final thickness. And if there is like a tiny bit of lip in the joints, it's not that big a deal. So squeeze all these together That's just too lazy to take a piece down and cut it on a chop saw. That worked beautifully.
Okay, let's see if this fits on here. So you're probably wondering why is this so much thicker than the rest of the top. I've got a plan, don't know if it's going to work yet, but um, what I'm planning to do is kind of have like a bit of a rim, maybe 3 8 or so around the profile here. And then this part here, I'm going to carve it out so that it'll kind of roll from flush right here, right? So it's going to be flush and then it's going to kind of scoop up to this rim here. Um, I just saw it in my head. I thought, man, that would look kind of cool. Um, so we're going to go for it. So I'm going to use my uh, Arbortech power carving bit on my angle grinder just to start scooping this out and get rid of most of the material. Uh, just leaving about three eighths along the edge there and then I'll get the sanding attachment and try to feather it in here so it's gonna be a bit of a challenge for sure just kind of freehand carbon it but I think I'm up to the task I think I'm gonna trace a line right here so I know where the where the top meets the edge and then I'm just gonna take this off and put it in a vise and do it that way because if the the carving bit or whatever takes a chunk out of some spot that I don't want to take a chunk out of and I've got to replace the piece I don't want it to be glued to my top because then and then I'm screwed then the whole top's got to get cut or shortened and stuff so I'm gonna do the carving first and then once I'm happy with how everything fits then I'll glue the whole thing together Well, I've had this workbench for like six years now. Man, time flies since I built this. Feels like yesterday, but uh, my handles are not. Okay, so it looks like the uh, set screw is not grabbing there. Because these handles are not really, not really sinking anymore. So the chain, I thought the chain might, might have slipped off, but it looks like it's still intact. Anyways, I'm just going to pull this off and see what's going on inside these gears here. And I love this little set of Allen key wrenches. I can't stand those little fold out ones that are just like such a finicky pain in the butt. These ones are so nice with the handles. Got this at Princess Auto. Just keep it on my workbench all the time and super handy because you seem to all have seems like all the woodworking machinery has allen key screws and grub screws in it so it's like you always need the allen keys handy and it's got both metric and imperial so i guess i'm thinking i set tighten this screw here
Okay, so this is the uh, Arbitec Turbo Plane, which is my favorite uh, power carving bit that I've used so far. Uh, they got a whole bunch of other products that work well for their intended purposes, but I find that this one is the most versatile for what I'm doing, like shaping wood and and kind of being able to finesse the finish a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I love this little turbo plane. So I'm just going to start uh, scooping out the wood here and feather down to my line that I drew. Get you know, probably within an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch so that then I can just sand the rest without having to sand for hours and hours. And then I'm just going to bring it up to my line here and then just try to dish it out a little bit. So it kind of looks like the edge of a leaf, you know, the underside of a leaf. You know how the leaf kind of curls along the edge and up to the tip, especially like oak leaves. You know how they kind of have that like pillowed, pillowed look. That's what we're going for. But I guess it's reverse reverse pillowing. I don't know. Shut up, Jesse. Cutting wood. So, as I suspected, this is going to look dope AF. Um, so, I'm just trying to feather it in here with the sander. Because I want this kind of flat surface to roll a little bit under there. And then I want it to kind of scoop up just in like the two inches near the edge, right? So, I kind of want it to feel flat, like this is really a part of this. And then it just kind of lips right up and then I'm gonna round this as well I'm gonna round the underside probably a little bit steeper put a quarter inch round over here and then kind of feather that in so it kind of has like a like a rolled edge and then same here probably just a 1 8 round over on the edge front edge and then probably a bigger one like half inch or, or just a tape like an elliptical round over to kind of give it like that look the look, you know. So I've got about a 16, 30 second here that I gotta keep feathering it in. So I'm trying not to like hit my sander here, right? I wanna hit it right here. So I'm kind of floating it a little bit and then just scooping down to try and get it flush. And I don't wanna dish this out at all. So I'm just using like the natural curve of the disc there to kind of go along and just make sure I don't touch right there. So some of you might be wondering, like, how do you do this and get consistent results? Now, I would say like with anything in woodworking and probably many other trades is you have to come up with a pattern or like a repeatable process, right? And so with sanding, I think a lot of people get to sanding and they're just like, oh, okay, let's just give it a sand. And they're putting the sander all over the place. But with the sand, like with sanding, Sandy can make or break a project. So for me, I always go with a pattern, right? If I'm sanding a surface, right? I go back and forth, I count my strokes, right? I overlap my strokes by half the pad typically, right? Because I don't want to round one area or dish one area out because I'm sitting there with the sander too long and then other areas I skimp on, right? So I'm working back, right? I'm just doing a little stroke overlap, overlap, right? I just do that the whole way. I'm not just kind of randomly going at it like a lot of people might or novices might, right? You got to really just stick to your pattern, right? So it's like you do one pass, just little short strokes, and then you cut them back and overlap them diagonally so that you're not, you know, creating sander marks. So you kind of really have to be conscious and counting 
your your pattern and stick with it right it might it might take hours but at least you'll have a consistent finish as opposed to something that's just all smooth but like lumpy and bumpy right All right, let's glue this thing up. I've dry fit it already, so I know everything is gonna fit. And yes, put some glue in there. Oh, but Samurai, you can't put glue in a breadboard end because of expansion and contraction. It's going to split apart into pieces. Okay, we'll see. I've done about, I think, eight breadboard end tabletops, all different sizes, all different wood species that have never had one fail me, and I've glued the crap out of all of them. So, uh,. Yeah, I don't really believe that breadboard ends shouldn't be glued because I just, I have experience that tells me it's okay to glue them. But hey, if you're afraid of your wood cracking apart, you do your breadboard ends however you want. So here's the underside of the table. I've got it all sanded. The breadboard ends are nice and flush and smooth, sanded up to 150 grit. Um, so now I've got, I think this is like a 15 degree or like chamfer bit. I don't know if you can see that very closely, but uh, it's, a, it's a Freud uh, Diablo bit or whatever, Freud bit. Um, and it's just a very, very shallow chamfer bit with a flush bearing on it. So what that's going to do is, so I'm going to go from the underside here just to create a bit of a, a kind of upward bevel, but not too steep. I just don't want square ends. You know, I like to kind of soften all my edges. So I'm going to do this and then I'm going to maybe, uh, put a bigger round over bit in just to kind of give it like a bit of an elliptical round over as opposed to just doing like a quarter inch and then leaving a flat section. I want it to kind of, you know, roll up from the bottom and then a slight angle to the top. So. I'm do a little bit of back milling because fur is really splintery and with a shallow bit like this, it could easily just rip a chunk out. So if you go with the direction of the spin of the bit, it won't tear out any wood. It doesn't leave as nice of a finish, but I'm just going to use it just to take that first little bit of the edge off and then I'll come back going against the rotation of the bit just to, just kind of like on scary areas. So this straight section, this should be all right because it's got a kind of a curved end to it, but I just, I heard a little bzzz, which means that the wood is kind of in prone to splitting mode. It also depends on the grain of your wood a lot of the time. All right, so if this board, if the grain is kind of going like this, when you bring the router bit on it, it wants to split off. If the grain's going like this, it's not so much, right? Or if it's totally vertical. So a lot of times it has to do with the grain of the wood, but sometimes routers just make a mess of things. So 
I'm just gonna sand that in, right? Kind of blend it. I'm really liking how this turned out with that. Nice little lip detail. You can tell I still got some little inconsistencies in the curve there.